Hello, Beagle Rampant viewers. I am Stephen J. Rolfus. And I am Doug Weiss. And we are here to give you a short historical tour of one of the coolest places in all of Cincinnati. Spring Grove Cemetery. Now, if any of you folks are ever visiting Cincinnati, I know you want to you want to go to the Cincinnati Art Museum. Yeah, I know you want to go see the Cincinnati Reds playing what they try to pass off as baseball. Kings and Island. Kings Island. The Bengals. The zoo. The zoo. Normally, when you go to another city, you don't say, "Hey, I got to visit the graveyard." I'm like, okay, in Los Angeles, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to see Bella Lugosi's grave. In Atlanta, that's what I wanted to do as well. Well, we're weird. We're, we're history people. We admit it. We admit it. <laughs> Spring Grove Cemetery is one of the most beautiful places you'll ever find. Um, there are lakes and fountains and waterfalls and paths and very, Statues. very unique gravestones and the place is just filled to overflowing with history and famous people and indeed there are uh, but i do believe we have one right here why don't you tell the nice beagle rampant people all about mr lawler well mr lawler was a philadelphia resident lived most of his life in philadelphia where he was a banker and a American Revolutionary War hero. He was the commandant of a privateering group. Pirates! <laughs> and <laughs> he ran a bunch of pirates. <laughs> and he moved to Cincinnati in the later part of his life. And he was originally buried in an Episcopal cemetery, but later moved to beautiful Spring Grove Cemetery when it opened in 1847. This, this is his grave here. This very unique Sphinx grave. They had a heck of a time getting the cemetery to approve the use of this gravestone because the Sphinx was part of pagan mythology and this is a Christian cemetery. They have finally, uh, they were finally able to uh, prevail. You have the Sphinx, one of the most unique gravestones in the cemetery now their standards are a little bit different they, they there's one there's SpongeBob. a gravestone of spongebob squarepants there is so much history here i think we ought to get to it what do you say i think that sounds like a great idea let's go find some let's history. find something right now Dying, Egypt, dying, ebbs the crimson life tide fast, and dark Plutonian shadows gather on the evening blast. Those fantastic bits of uh, Victorian poetry, the opening to the poem Antony and Cleopatra, was written by this man here. Brigadier General William Haynes Lytle. He was very much a Renaissance man. His grandfather was another William Lytle, one of the founders of Cincinnati. The original William Lytle led a group of settlers down the Ohio River to the branch of the Licking River. This bunch of flatboats went on for five miles, and I guess you would call that a flotilla and not a bunch, but as soon as they landed on the Ohio River, they got into a, a little disagreement with the local Shawnees, who saw all the settlers coming and they figured, ah, oh, there goes the neighborhood. 
So they got into a running gun battle with the Shawnees, and a great deal of this battle was fought on what is now Fountain Square. Now, William's father was Robert Lytle, who was a very famous politician of the day. They were all involved in the military. Thus, we come to William Haynes Lytle, and this is going to cause a little bit of dissension. This is something that I get into arguments with people at the Cincinnati History Museum, uh, my fellow volunteers, quite often. William Lytle was an incredibly good poet. He was not, however, in my opinion, my humble opinion, I'm sorry, General, I don't think he was a good general. This is why. He had the mindset pretty much of what a samurai. His whole life was based on trying to be the great uh, fighter and warrior that his grandfather was. Lytle was so badly wounded at Perryville, it was believed that he was dead. He was gone. That was it. Um, as it so they gave him brevet brigadier general. Turns out he lived. So now he's brigadier general Lytle. Come 1863 under General Rosecrans and he is directly under General Major General Sheridan and they're going south. Braxton Bragg once again was his opponent. Coming after them, Braxton Bragg, I, I, I just have to mention, I think he is one of the most underestimated uh, generals of the entire Civil War. Bragg was able to engage the Union Army at a horrible place in the middle of nowhere called Chickamauga. Now during the night of the battle, of I think like the second or third day of the battle, you have to bear with me on that one, he, um, Bragg was reinforced by James Longstreet, Robert E. Lee's right-hand man at this point. Um, now, Bragg outnumbers Rosecrans like three, four to one. There's no way Rosecrans can win. Lytle is on top of a hill, and the Confederates start to charge. Now, anyone with a lick of sense and a little bit of strategy would say, this is not my day, we better fall back, we better regroup. What does Lytle say? Charge! That's how we got to Spring Grove. On a military statue in the United States and some other cultures, you look at the horse. If the horse has all four legs on the ground, then the person riding the horse got through the battle or the war uh, unscathed. If one leg of the horse is raised, then that person was wounded in that battle. If both front legs of the horse are up off the ground, that means the person on the horse um, died in battle. So, our, what do we make of our great warrior poet? Well, General, as one writer to another, I salute you. As a man who gave his life in uniform for his country, I most definitely salute you. And it is so darn hot today. Doug, you know what I need? I'll tell you what I need. I need a beer. Let's find someone who can get us a beer. right across the street from General Lytle and we're thirsty and we want to see someone who's going to get us a beer. Well, here's the man to do it, Gottlieb Mulhauser. Now Doug, uh, 
I know you you absolutely hate to touch beer or any fermented beverages, but maybe you could give us just a little bit of history about uh, Herr Gottlieb here. Uh, well, Mr. Mulhauser and jo Johann Windisch uh, colluded together and created one of Cincinnati's largest breweries called the Lion Brewery. It was down on Central Parkway. Uh, took up about a block and a half. Um, unfortunately, when Prohibition came along, it kind of ended their business and uh, later the building was torn down. Um, but the John Houck Brewery, right down the street from him. Oh, that was right. John Houck? I, I, I've never heard of him. Could you Tell me more about him. Let's talk about more about John right next door. Well, let's take a trip. This is spontaneous, you know. This is just like History Channel. All right, so here we are at the grave of John Houck, one of Cincinnati's uh, largest beer barons. Uh, there are a number of beer barons buried here in the Spring Grove Cemetery. Uh, John Houck owned the John uh, owned the Houck Brewery on uh, Central Avenue in, in Cincinnati, just a little bit south of Lynn Street. Um, he came here in 1863 to work for his uncle. Came here from Munich to work with his uncle George Herrencourt, who owned a brewery at the west end of the Western Hills Viaduct. Uh, parts of the brewery still stand today, the office and the bottling house, but the brewery itself has long been torn down. After a while, John, John Houck's cousin, uh, George Herrencourt, who owned the Cincinnati Reds, went bankrupt, and John bought the Cincinnati Reds from, the, uh, from, from his cousin. So while he was owner of the Cincinnati Reds, he's the one that introduced the sale of beer to the Reds games. So that's what I know about John. Then there is a surprise here. For those who visit Spring Grove, almost nobody sees this. But if you look at Mr. Houck's, love you Mr. Houck, um, his gravestone, you will see there are hidden faces in it. Can you find the hidden faces? kind of like a tombstone version of Where's Waldo. What do you think? Should we tell him? While we're still thirsty for a beer, you cannot possibly pass up this family, the Moorline family. In fact, if you come to Cincinnati and you go to the new area called the Banks, there is a Moorline logger house. Is it logger house or ale house? It's logger house. Logger house. Right down on the river, beautiful place. I highly nice recommend it. the river. Now this, a nice view of the river, or so a little birdie just told me from one of these trees. Now, Christian Moorline is the one who started the brewery. But I want to talk very briefly, because we just kind of wandered by here, about this fellow, George Moorline. Now when he was a teenager and daddy owned a very prosperous brewery in Cincinnati, George used to come galloping down the uh, Vine Street. He would ride his horse right into a tavern, ride it up to a bar, grab a stein of beer, drink it in one gulp, put the beer down and ride his horse out. And of course, all the Germans in the uh, tavern were shouting and cheering, hey, George. Well, he settled down when he was a bit older. He formed what was called the Elm Street Club. 
This is on Race Street. Oh, the train's in. And right now, one of our newest breweries, Rheingeist, is in pretty much the same exact spot. The Elm Street Club consisted of brewers and other big interests. They really held the political strings in Cincinnati. The political boss definitely listened to the Elm Street Club. In 1884, when there was the three days of the courthouse riot, the courthouse was burned down, the Gatling guns are being shot right at the rioters, and the mayor said, all the rioters are drunk. We got to shut down the tavern. Well, guess what? Mr. Windish, who was a member of George Moorline's little fraternity, was sitting right at the meeting going. And there was a third day of rioting as a result. But if you are still wanting a beer and you're in Cincinnati, well, I'm afraid you can't get a Vintage beer, you can't get a Mohauser beer, you can't get a Hulk beer, you can still get a Moorline. And I, I could use one right now. This is one of the most popular spots in all of Spring Grove. This is a beautiful mausoleum dedicated to the Fleischmann family. This is Julius Fleischmann. He was uh, a mayor of Cincinnati, a very big mover and shaker. And of course, he's also the founder of the Fleischmann Margarine Company, which still exists. Now, if you come here on a Saturday evening, you will always see a wedding party having their pictures taken in front of this. Now, Doug, I, I believe there was something about some yeast that uh, happened with Julius. Well, there was at one time a rumor going around that Julius Caesar and Mr. Hudipole and Mr. Moorline were touring in Germany. And they went into view a brewery to tour a brewery and they were making lager beer. And the lager beer was made with a special yeast. And these guys tried to purchase the yeast, but you weren't allowed to purchase it. So the story is that Julius Fleischmann stole some of the yeast, brought it back to Cincinnati. They cultivated it, and hence we had our big brouhaha. God love you, Mr. Fleischmann. This is the Edmund Dexter Mausoleum, the Dexter family mausoleum. It is really the showpiece of Spring Grove, especially if you're into the Gothic thing. Problem is, the family who made this, not so Gothic, more of a normal but very wealthy family. Doug, why don't you tell us all of the mysteries about the Dexter family? Well, the Dexter family began with uh, Edmund Dexter, who was an Englishman who immigrated to Cincinnati around 1820, uh, married a girl in New York, and then moved to Cincinnati, where he uh, developed his um, liquor business. He distributed liquor here in uh, Cincinnati. And uh, he, it was down on uh, 4th and Broadway Street. And um, he amassed quite a bit of money. And he died in 1862 and was buried in some unknown location. We don't really know where he was originally buried. His son took over the business and decided to build uh, this Gothic mausoleum, which was uh, designed by James, James Keyes Wilson. Um, and 1866, when the building was built, the construction was never finished. Um, but 
uh, all the family members except for four were buried here. Um, Steve, did you want to talk about the flying buttresses? The flying buttresses, uh, we'll, we'll get an angle a little in a moment and let you get a close-up of them. This is the only example of flying buttress architecture in Cincinnati proper. Now, right across the river at that incredible basilica, uh, they also have flying buttresses. Flying buttresses were a way to keep the ceiling from collapsing without having to use a lot of pillars like you see in, uh, like, say, a, a Greek temple. So it was really, in the early medieval period, an incredible uh, architectural innovation. It allowed more spacious, open buildings. And this is a small version of it. And there is one other very unique part about this chapel, and that's the elevator. Doug, why don't you tell them all about the elevator? Well, the elevator. It's, it's an elevator. The <laughs> elevator originally, in the original design, the Took elevator. A surprise there. <laughs> a little bit. The elevator was designed to go from the bottom where the mausoleum is, where where the bodies are actually buried, up to the top where there's a chapel up there with a 40-foot ceiling. And they uh, had this elevator so that you could take the bodies up to the chapel and then lower them down into the uh, mausoleum. Uh, the, what was Crypt. the Crypt. Uh, no, what was the vehicle that carries the bodies to the hearse? Grave? The hearse would pull up here we to, forget to these the bottom. Technical terms. <laughs> Well, who would have ever thought hearse? The hearse would pull up here to the bottom at the at the uh, elevator, and then the bodies could be lifted up to to the chapel. But it was never completed, and it's not complete today. Uh, you can't get in the inside of the chapel. At one time you could, but the floors are unstable now, and they have it gated off, so you can't get in there. You can't look around. Uh, I have found some pictures on the internet at a time when you could get into the inside of the Dexter Chapel, but uh, they're hard to find and you're very lucky if you can get them. Now I should preface this little bit of the talk by saying I don't believe it. This is something that I read about in a number of spots on the internet. But of course, as we know, anything you see on the internet has to be true. That You can't put anything false on the internet. But there is an urban legend in Cincinnati about the Dexter Mausoleum, which says that if you stand on the steps looking out, you will see, or you may see, the Kun Anuvan running past. Now, whether they go from west to east or east to west, I imagine it would be east to west, um, they don't specify. Now you are probably asking yourself, what is it that he is mispronouncing? What is this Kun Anuvan? Kun, the hounds. Anuvan, hell, the land of the dead, Sheol. And there goes the, <laughs> there goes the little plastic bottle that I found lying <laughs> on the ground here. <laughs> Someone would come to a beautiful place like this and litter. I can't believe it. The Kuna They are white ghost dogs with blood red ears. And they appear throughout Celtic folklore. Uh, if you've ever read the Mabinogian, and if you are a mystical, uh, spiritual type person who likes mythology and strange things, let me promise you, the Mabinogian makes Alice in Wonderland look like tariff regulations. But at the very beginning of the Mabinogian, the Prince of Divid, a man named Piff, is hunting and he sees a stag. And all of a sudden, a group of blo uh, blood red ears and ghostly white dogs descend upon the. Um, the stag and then he drives off the ghost dogs and puts his own dogs 
uh, on the stag. And then who should come along but Aran, the king of the underworld, kind of like Hades, but in Celtic mythology, and that leads to a whole lot of adventures. But, like they say, now the urban legend says that if we stand on these steps, we can look out and we will see those ghostly white dogs with the blood red ears running, I would imagine, from the east to the west because they would be headed to the land of the dead. Doug, what do you say? Shall we see some puppies? Gonna walk over here and see. Let's let's, let, let, let's get over here and, and see some doggies. Of course, you have heard the expression when Grant took Richmond. Ha! Pishaw, I say, Pishaw. This man was the one who took Richmond. It was a German from Cincinnati, General Godfrey Weitzel. Now, General Weitzel was born in Lorraine. Today, that area is France. Back then, it was Germany. And then it became France, and then it, it kind of goes back and forth. He came to Cincinnati. He wound up in uh, West Point, and he became an engineer. Before the Civil War, he worked in New Orleans, and he designed military defenses for the city. Later on, when the Civil War broke out, he was part of the people who was besieging the city of New Orleans. And guess what? He knew where all the defenses were. He was also in a number of other battles, which I, which no one can see me looking at the paper here. Uh, he was part of the Army of the James. Uh, he conducted defenses along the Potomac. But the thing that he is most famous for is the siege of Richmond. Now, you have to bear in mind, if anyone is watching this is from Richmond, you know what I'm talking about. During the time that the Confederate government had fallen, the city was in chaos. There were people rioting in the streets. They were running about insane. They were setting fires. One man had a group of 40 slaves chained together trying to put them on a train to get them out of the city so he could sell them. I don't know where the heck he thought he could go at that point in 1865, but he was trying. It didn't work. Uh, and I hope all those poor people got free with no problem. The fires were so bad that the mayor of Richmond, Joseph Mayo, said, oh my goodness, I've got to surrender the city. We've got to get some responsible adults in this city before it burns down. So he goes running out into the Union lines. He talks to a major and a captain, and he says, I'm the mayor. I want to surrender the city. They take him to Godfrey Weitzel. Weitzel gets on his horse, brings his troops. He took Richmond. And just for the record, his men got the fires out got control of the city, restored order. A few days later, Abraham Lincoln comes, and Weitzel is pretty much still the man in charge, even though Grant had come in, but Grant was still searching for Lee, and he was moving towards Appomattox. Weitzel was behind running Richmond, and Weitzel says, well, what do you want me to do with the people of Richmond? And Lincoln said, just Treat them with mercy, kindness, let's get this over with, let's end this war, let's become one. So Weitzel develop, starts a very light touch to the people of Richmond, the former Confederates. Unfortunately, a few days later, Lincoln is murdered. And now Weitzel is, is still going very light 
on the Confederates, but the new people in charge think, oh, he must be a Confederate sympathizer. And he wound up in all manner of trouble. But he wound up back here in Cincinnati and in the year of the riot we talked about late, earlier, uh, 1884, um, Weitzel uh, passed away. And now he's one of the hardest generals to find in Spring Grove. Trust me, I know. Now we are going to come to one of the saddest graves in all of Spring Grove. This is little six-year-old Carrie Hurley. We don't know a whole lot about her except for the fact that she died of diphtheria in upstate New York. Her family lived at the end of 4th Street. Uh, from what I can gather, it might have been at the location of the Grand Hotel. But beyond that, it's just a six-year-old girl, but you can see the statue of her. And the people of Cincinnati have really taken her to heart for some reason. I have seen, at Christmas time, I've seen presents in front of the uh, thing. Yeah, I've seen Easter baskets, and you will always find a whole bunch of coins, little offerings, for this poor little girl who died at six years old. And we're going to add another offering. I am so sorry to say that is all of the time that we have for our visit to Spring Grove Cemetery. Uh, we really hate to leave you. We've had a really good time. We hope you enjoy what you've seen and come back to Beagle Rampant for much, much more. Now, if you're in Cincinnati visiting or if you live here, please check this place out. It is incredible. What we showed you today is barely the beginning of the surface. And when you come, be sure to check uh, at the visitor's desk at the, at the office. Have them give you a map. <laughs> I think you'll need map a map. Map will be needed, yes. yes. I've been lost many a times in the cemetery. And you get a list of uh, where the Civil War generals are buried. Uh, I think it is 40 Union generals, one Confederate general. Uh, we're not going to show you that grave because of the way people are nowadays. But for Stephen J. Rolfus and Doug Weiss, and for Jordan, who is behind the camera this time, normally he's in front telling you about video games or his wild adventures in other countries. Today, he's just filming. But we want to thank you so much for joining us. The Beagle Rampant subscribers and viewers are the best anywhere on the internet. And if you like, if you like the Spring Grove, if you like the history, put something in the comments. Tell us that, how much you enjoyed it, what you would like to see, and we'll see if we can talk uh, Jordan into coming out and doing this all again. With different sites, though. They're different. Oh, yeah. there's so many more oh, people yeah. uh, that we didn't begin to see today. But if you like history, it's a good place to go. But even if you don't like history, if you just like art, there's a lot of stuff here for everybody to see. You can't come into the cemetery and not go out feeling like you saw something special. This place is a world in its own. So, for Stephen J. Rolfus, Doug Weiss, and Jordan Rolfus, and Jordan behind the camera, I'll be there saying, 